Yes. Okay, hello everyone. It's great to be at a DConf again. Uh, I'm the least uh, presentation. After this, we're done. Um, as I've been watching the previous presentations, and as I talk to some of the presenters, there is lots of resonance in the D community. Whoever presented any topic, everybody said, oh, I'm going to say the same thing in one of my presentations, and I felt the same thing. Everybody's talking about the same powerful features of D. Okay. Um, but I, I'm not going to lie, I added a couple of slides just because others use the same slides. <laughs> Okay, so I work at Mercedes-Benz Research and Development North America, Inc. I work right at that building, right around the corner behind the building. It's such, such a dramatic building, and the skies are always that dramatic. It's a happy place. Um, I'm a part of the Autonomous Driving Project, which is a joint project by Daimler and Bosch. And this car looks awesome, but I've never seen it. I think it's an artist's rendering. The real car looks like this. It's still awesome. It's the S-Class. And this car will be running in San Jose, California. And sometime this year, by the end of this year, we will have um, autonomous taxi service between the, some Caltrain station and some shopping area. Um, uh, everybody said they are hiring. I want to put the hiring thing up front to get rid of it. Uh, so that's directly from our website mbrdna.com. I have good things to say about this company. I'm very happy. And we're not only about autonomous driving. At the bottom, you can see all the other teams that we have. The blue one is where I am at. So the content of this talk will be, I will first describe the problem where I use D, or the problem that I use D to solve. It's about ROS, bag files, bag file migration. I'll show the solution, and at the end, it will be just a random uh, presentation of the D features that I liked, I, I enjoyed while writing this tool. Uh, pretty random, you will see. Um, first of all, ROS is Robot Operating System. Uh, it's at ROS.org. It's not actually a kernel operating system. It lives in the application level. It manages its applications, brings them up, even builds them. And it manages their message passing between them. So it's very useful for academic research, let's say, for robots. Um, the most important thing for me is that it records message streams as bag files for the researchers to replay later on. You go to the lab, start the robot, it moves around, collects some sensor data. And then you go to your desk on your computer, replay those sensors, and see how your new algorithms work on those sensors. It's basically a message stream saved in a file. And it comes with some awesome tools, one of which is RViz. It's the robot uh, visualization tool. I'm sure you've seen many 3D images of self-driving cars. You can rotate this image, and you can see the car driving in it when you treat a car like a robot. This is just a simple sample. Uh, a 3D point cloud accumulated semantic LIDAR points. And the semantic information is represented by color in this case. You can, you can do pretty much anything with this tool. Pretty cool. Before you guys uh, get any ideas, in self-driving technology, functional safety is top priority. So you cannot put any software component on the car, like the hardware components, and the car drives by itself. Um, if you want to learn more about functional safety in um, automobiles, ISO 26262, and also learn about ACIL ABCD levels, all I'm going to say is ROS is not ACIL D certified, so it cannot be on the car. So don't go thinking, uh, Mercedes-Benz is using ROS on the vehicle, what a disaster. We don't. This is just a research tool. Um, I hope this is visible from all the way back there. So ROS bag file is just a series of messages, as I said, as well as the uh, connections that the ROS system um, recorded. A connection is a publisher of messages, so here's a connection made. And that connection sent two messages. Another connection came in. It sent its messages. And the first connection continued sending these messages. So they're all saved. 
It's a uh, publish subscribe style um, system. Every message has a topic. You publish on that topic, and clients read um, under that topic. So one great thing about ROS is every connection records the message type, exact message type that is dumping into this file. And it's defined in textual format, just like you would expect in a D struct. So this one says, I have an array of foos and a float 32. And right underneath, the connection information, type information, also includes what foo is. And foo is a bar and an int 32. And then, to complete the entire definition, and a bar is just an int 64. So this is great because even a tool like um, any tool can read this file and serialize and deserialize that information from the bit that the message contains. And here's a message record. Um, I skipped it too quickly. Maybe every uh, connection says I'm ID 42. It has an ID, or maybe ROS system assigns it. There's a topic. And then messages are recorded at that timestamp from that connection, and here is some zeros on, and ones. This zeros and ones can be represented um, in a D struct like this, or a, a set of structs. And everything is little endian with one byte alignment. There is no alignment loss in this uh, format. So the problem is, once you go out to the lab and record your message stream, that is stuck with that definition, message definition, the binary definition in there. During research, you change your types and now decide that you also have to publish the J information. Your file doesn't have it, and you cannot look at this message as two in 32s. You somehow need to inject a J into that byte block uh, so that your new algorithm can read it, uh, even from the file. So this is called migration. The problem is a general one. Open source community has its solutions for this. And the solution is to uh, version every type, or uh, every type with some MD5 sum, and I'm going to call them ABC here. Let's say during its development life cycle, a type starts with an int 32, then gains a float 32. Then at some point, you decide one int 32 wasn't enough. You change it to an array of seven in 32s, then what you need to do is to write a rule to convert that object to this object. The existing members are pretty simple, 2a equals from a, but the, for the new members, you need to invent some values. Uh, so 1.5 may mean something, you can do that, or in this case, you may decide that the existing type single in 32 should be repeated seven times, and the x, um, it directly comes from the previous one. So the existing migration solutions are either Python or C++, because ROS has only two APIs today, as far as I know. Um, there's an automatic diffing of the type information in the file to the new versions of your types, and the Python solution generates .bmr, meaning bag migration rule file, I think. Uh, so what the developer needs to do is generate this BMR, edit the file to add this, oh, I want to say 2x equals 1.5 information in it, and then they apply this BMR on the file to get a new file with that, uh, those bits in it. The developer confirms that this rule file has been looked at by a human by setting valid equals true. So the generation creates a member that says valid equals false. For the system to trust you, you need to go and change it to true. I, I, I heard there are some limitations with latch topics. I'm not going to get into or, or any of that. For the C++ solution, you have to have both the old type of the um, old version of the type and the new version of the type. You need to create link a single program that knows exactly that rule. So these are the existing ones. Um, so the D solution that I came up with is a statically typed rule generation. Instead of the valid equals true, I decided to inject compilation errors into the rule file with D syntax. This is I equals question mark. So the DMD gives me a compilation error saying, you need to do something here. 
So the, the rule that generates knows there's a new member called i, but it cannot invent a value for you, so it, it invents a compilation error or injects. <laughs> and it worked pretty well. This equals question. At some point, I decided, uh, experimented with static asserts. Static assert, please do something here. But this is very short and produces very readable code. Error message. Um, so the idea is, as you change your types, the, these rules are generated in D. And the migrator program knows about all the rules because it links with all of them once the developer removes the compilation errors. Now this migrator knows all your past history dump any bag file to it, it knows which MD5 sum to which MD5 sum and applies the rules as necessary to bring your old bag file to an up-to-date bag file. That's the idea. Um, so the big question for all of us is, how do you introduce D to your work uh, environment? What are the resistance? How is it going to work? So invest your own time. So this is a quote from one of the earlier talks. I think Bastian said that. So th this is the kind of re resonance I'm talking about. So th that's exactly what I did. I saw a need for such a tool, or the existing tools were limited. I said, this looks like a fun project for D, all playing with the bits and just reading an input file and producing a file, very simple stuff, which I thought would take two weeks. It took about four months. <laughs> So as I was w working with this, um, news traveled by word of mouth. And interestingly, a team in Germany actually assigned to this task. And they heard about this solution versus other things that they might write. And they just compared all the solutions, all the possible solutions. They made a table and can do this, check, check, can't, impossible, check, check. And even though the solution is written in D, just because it was written and it was working, not fully, but <laughs> promisingly, they just chose D without knowing a single line of anything about D. <laughs> so I think that speaks volumes about the project that I work under. So we have open-minded people trying to solve problems. Um, oh, of course, I convinced them most of the migration rules are just simple assignments. So assignment in D is not different from assignment in Python or C++. <coughs> the syntax is the same. So that was important, and they agreed, and that's accepted. Um, as I said, there was no arguing whatsoever. When I sold D to my colleagues, it was just pleasant talk. And when I joined them, I told them, every time we talk about C++, any question comes, you will hear me saying, that's not a problem in D, or <laughs> we solve it this way in D, and it was all very pleasant, uh, nice uh, communication, no arguing whatsoever. And actually, my <coughs> colleagues were the biggest pushers of the D solution more than me. They actually liked the solution and pushed for it. And this comes to Attila's thing. We're all humans, so the human interaction is the most important thing. I don't remember whether I have a slide for that, but. So these are actual quotes or paraphrase quotes. Someone loved a solution so much that this tool turned into, man, write tools at work and they will come. So just make it work. Someone did, did this, I love it, great. And somebody wrote me that exact quote at the end, so just like other people, in the, especially in the game community, they have to use C++, but they, not everybody loves C++, so they are looking for an um, alternative. Okay, this is a big question now. Even though there were Python and C++ APIs that we could use to write this tool, I wrote the tool on my own and I actually introduced a new API to this bag files, which can be open sourced later on. I don't like the code yet, you know how you feel. It's pretty dirty. Once cleaned up, it might be the third uh, live language out there. So this is a question for everyone to answer. Do you want to use the existing and know only as much as you're exposed and only as much as you hit bugs and learn workarounds? Or you write it for yourself and become an expert in it? So now we have experts in-house who know bank files from every bit of it. 
because we implemented an API that deals with it. So it's to everyone to decide. But one serendipitous thing happened is, while I was working on this, people started to hear, oh, Ali has that bag file tool that solves that problem. And they started coming to me, can your tool do this? Hmm, no, because mine is just a migration from begin to end. They wanted some random access like patterns. Okay, random access is pretty easy actually. The ROS bag file format is very friendly to random access because they somehow define where every message is. So you can filter up front. And that occasion that someone came to me saying, can you do this, turned a several minute job that they were struggling with into a half second job. Not that others couldn't do it, but because we are experts on it, now we can build on top of it and build new tools with it. Now, you have a two terabyte file at a file server somewhere. We have a web interface. Any developer can, can come in and say, oh, there's a bug in this algorithm. Can you show me on that drive out there a second 10.5, what was the camera image there? Click, it's there. So the tool behind the scenes grabs the image in half a second and displays it. This is, is a huge enabler, so they love it. Again, right tool that does the right thing, they will come. And I, I bet this solution will be the all, basis of our, our all ROS bag tools that we will need. Okay, this, here's the design. I've already talked about it, but to look at it, there's a tool called RuleGen. It knows about the existing message files. It looks at a message file that you modified, and the beauty is this runs at build time or at CI time. So if you change it type and you forget to introduce its rule file, you will get a compilation error. So it diffs the two, generates a D file, which has that injected compilation error in it. Then you build that rule file, build a migrator with that rule and the known rules, link all of them together, make a migrator, and dump any existing back to it, you get out migrated back files. This is the design. Um, so here is an actual generated D code. Let's say you have a message A, which had an int 32i in it. I put that underscore from and underscore to to differentiate them. And here is the new field that the diffing detected and injected into the new type. Then the code also generates an update function, which will be executed for the migration. And you receive a const ref to the existing from object that's in the back file. Here's the generated compilation error. And all you need to do is replace that with zero, maybe reach into the from object's existing i and have it. Or you, you also have the topic that this message was uh, published under, topic.length, that, that's something. So that's all the developer needs to do in most cases. Of course, nobody, almost nobody at the company is uh, familiar with the D syntax. In some cases, this new field is an array. So the code generation is smart and tries to generate code that's uh, friendly to other programmers. For example, now, it's, if it's a scalar, it's just an equals question mark. In some cases, the new field is a dynamic array. Then I inject two compilation errors. One of them says, what's the length of this array? And I write the for each loop for them with the size ti, so they don't need to know these versions of for each. And lm is a ref equals question mark. If uh, it's a static array, this line doesn't get generated. And in some cases, even though the code says lm equals question mark, I also put a comment here. If the variable's name was the same, but the type was different, hey, maybe you want to reach into from's existing array's ith element as a comment. If that's the case, they just remove the comment, remove that line, and it compiles. OK, so that's the design. That's the tool. So let's get to the D experience report. Which this is the rambling section now. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the very first time that I've ever run how many lines of code on any of my programs. Because I remember Andre asking me, how many lines of code does your project have years ago? I'm like, I don't know. And he was shocked. 
So this time I ran it, and it's about, I don't know whether you blank, count the blanks, but just 4,500 lines. So it exists, from a, uh, exists off a D-Rosbag API. Two main programs that you've seen in that chart, RuleGen and Migrator, and the aligner is the serendipitous one. That's like a Swiss army knife. It can do almost anything. And the only external dependency we have is Dragosho's CMakeD, because it's a little difficult to introduce external stuff. It needs to go to some um, review process. And I didn't want to, um, and I didn't want to depend on other stuff. Just standard D and CMakeD, because the project uses CMake, so it to put it in. Okay, fun and rewarding. I, of course, loved working on this tool. It's very rewarding. When, when the uh, problem is simple also, you know, input, output. You can test that you're working, doing it um, correctly. Oh, and everybody is appreciative, so that's awesome. And uh, programming is about people is Attila's comment. And Leith said, Steve Jobs said, you can build your own things that other people can use. So all these um, Steve Jobs' comment, um, say it again? Steve Jobs or Atio, right? Yeah, same, yeah. So, uh, so I felt I grew, let's say. I, start, I felt what Steve Jobs meant here. So I felt more like an engineer at this project, let's say. There was a problem, I wanted to solve it. It wasn't always this feeling in other companies. Uh, at other places, you might feel like a cog. Now, here's the problem, go solve it. But here it's there, I want to solve it. And of course, D was a big part of it. I wanted to use D because D is really fun. And I don't need to tell you guys this. And plasticity, of course. I mean, whoever I talk to, yeah, I use Python for prototyping and we use C++ in production. And this is something we've been hearing a lot. Nope, I use D for prototyping and for, for production, just one language. And here it is, the code is not even optimized yet. I know the, some problems in there, but the problem is so I.O. based that I'm not gonna fix them until I see that they are problems. You read two gigabytes of, a, two terabytes of a file, you generate two terabytes of a file. It's over a file system, you know, it's the big problem. But I didn't leave obvious pessimizations in the code, of course. And I used garbage collector, of course. You know, no problem there. But I tried to do some premature optimization and I struggled with bugs in that area, as proven earlier. Okay, so this project has some casting bytes at the lowest level. As I said, the messages are in little and in binary format. I have a function called bytes as, and you can give any template parameter. Also see, I've used uh, contract in uh, expressions. I love this syntax. It, it's like unit test, it's an enabler. It makes the code look beautiful uh, as opposed to the older syntax. And of course, that's some template constraint. And this function works only if, if t is not a string. I have a sister function that does the string version. But of course, because I depend on Lidl and this, D gives me the tools to use a static assert and from the standard system check that this is a Lidl Endian system. Of course, I do that at runtime as well. This is the runtime check, that's the compile time check. Um, nested functions, because somebody mentioned it, it reminded me, I used nested functions and I love them. Um, my, uh, So one question I had when I introduced D to Norm Hardy was, uh, he is the famous capability-based OS guy. Unfortunately, we lost him. Um, he, his first question was, does D have nested functions? Yes, it does. Good. So it was his litmus test. And nested functions are great. They are basically closures or lambdas with a name. So I use them. It removes duplication. I used UDAs like most of the presenters here. For example, I haven't told you but the Rossback file has records and records have some opcode. I just put a, this is a back, back record struct. It represents that opcode 
uh, record, and the parser knows about this and uses it for its advantage. I don't need to do anything other than a single loop static for each item in there. The parser handles this. Many of you talked about removing boilerplate. This is what I did. Maybe it's buggy, but it worked. I usually have structs where both of the members or three of the members are taking part in the comparison. So instead of typing the three things all together, this can be string mixed in. And it's the standard boilerplate comparison that takes all members into account. OK, it's, yeah, it just works. Uh, <clears throat> oh, co code inspection, like most of you, um, I think there's some problem with the fonts, as I see. If it's displayed on that machine, looks like PowerPoint doesn't take the fonts. That's why everything is crooked here. Um, ju so just like compile time code in inspection, I think, oh, was that Steve? I forgot. So I say, if a struct has an update member, and if it's a function, then I call it. Because not only the rule struct is generated, there is also the supporting structs, and none of the supporting structs have this update function. So I call the update function if it's only the one I generated. So here it is. Of course, code correctness. I took advantage of many great features of D. Unit tests, I'm ashamed to say, and that may be the, one of the reasons why I can't release this code now. It's so low. So I used unit tests whenever a function was too complicated as a field. Like I'm coding this and I say, ah, oh, will this ever write? Oh, unit test. So I didn't do test-driven development, but I put tests only when I felt it was a tricky algorithm. There's one invariant. I'm going to show you that type. That much in and out, static assert, assert and enforce everywhere. Okay, this is something I want to mention. Um, I'm coming from a one year, I'm recovering from a one year Go programming uh, experience before this company. <laughs> and as you would expect, like any sane programmer or any non junior programmer should appreciate, I did not like the handing error codes from function to function to function. I think it's tedious and it's against programming mentality. You want things to be automated. <coughs> as long as you understand the cons of exceptions, you should use them to your advantage. And exceptions are extremely useful. I did not think about error handling. I just threw, I used enforces or asserts, like I said earlier, and everything worked. And paradoxically, I think error codes are error prone. I'm sure you guys know that too. And I have only eight try-catch blocks, four of them in the four main functions of the four tools, and four of them just to translate conversion exceptions from the lower layers to more readable text to give some context to that. Bounce checking, a wonderful feature. I caught myself many times almost checking, oh, does this associative array have that key? Oh, wait, I have the check already. Am I within limits in this uh, zero to length thing? Oh no, don't worry about it. It's already taken care of. Very useful. Okay, and these are my bugs. Who said these are bu <laughs> bugs? Okay, I admit. So I have these bugs in the code. Static for each is not a bug, but I have 97 for each. I have one for loop in there. I'll show you next. But I also used, of course, ranges to advantage. So I did not say every for each or explicit loop is a bug. I just, as a gut feeling, if it looked like a nice range chain, I used it. If it looked like too complicated, mostly for, for the next person that will look at this code, the team who is not experienced in D, I didn't want to go into uh, zip or enumerate. You know, I think they are one level higher than a chain of expressions. So once I needed that, I just put a for each loop in there. OK, here is the for loop that I used. At first, I wrote that. And it did not pass code review. A reviewer said, I had a brain stack overflow with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know that syntax? No? Look at that, four curly braces. There's a scope, or is that a scope? And there's no semicolon or nothing. Huh? 
This is a block statement. Yes. So it doesn't introduce a scope. This is actually a, the way of generating a for loop with multiple loop variables that are of different types. If it's the same type, you can you do like in C with a comma. That's correct. But later on, I realized, OK, I really did not need two of those. So this is the only for loop that I have. It's a C-style linked list traversing like thing. But in this case, the node information is not in any linked node, but they are in an associative array. So I start with the head in rules and rule next in rules. So that's the design. That's why I still kept this. It's a C-like. I'm sure we can do this with a generate function or something, but this is my bug. OK, let me show you what a real bug is. Not a loop. Format string uh, passed as, as a runtime argument. This is a design bug. Of course, because it explodes on your face at runtime, it's checked at runtime, and it's most of the time or often on the less traversed error checking code. You have some problem in your program, it prints an error, you can't see the error because this error printing exploded. That's why we have uh, the compile time checked format where you provide the string as a <coughs> compile time per argument. Look, look how the color changed. The bug was red. Oh, it's now nice. See, this is because of the font. I apologize. So the yellow ones are there and there, and green ones are here and there. So the problem is this is not good enough because the association is in your mind. We're using a programming language as a tool. There is an association there, tight association, but you can't express it programmatically. This caused me trouble, and I'll show you why I'm putting this here, why I had trouble with this, you will see soon. And this should be the correct way to do it. And I'm glad Seb mentioned this. This is the most desired feature change into D. I briefly mentioned it to Walter, who is not interested in my talk, and he should fix this. This is the good thing to do. And those comments are my, by my daughter when I said, Instead of da, what can we say? Obviously, naturally, this is the way it should be because there is no problem. You mean, I want the value of the name there. Of course, the syntax may not be the best one. I know Attila's opinion on this one, but I think this is really clean. Oh, this is the reason. Oh, let's go. Um. I just wanted to say that there is a very old pull request, Thank probably you. from yes. 2018 or something, that is basically giving this. And it has been reviewed like uh, 20, 30 times by different people. Yeah. Uh, many people want to merge it, but I don't know what's going on and what's happening with yeah. that pull request. But it's just 2018, right? Yeah. Two th wait for until... <laughs> 10 year old. Uh, so it's just new. I, I honestly believe that it should be pushed and, uh, uh, you know, so we should merge it as soon as possible. Yes, that's why I put this here. And here's the reason I have so many format, right formatted line, and right format statements in this program. Some of them in code generation, some of them in error strings, some of them in assert strings, wherever. So many. And you know, oh, let me put a new information in there and then put it in the parentheses and then come back, change the format. Uh, didn't feel good. It was less fun dealing with this. And I had this format string gotcha. When the string became too long, when I wrapped it to the second line, I put a <laughs> concatenation operator there, and that's a bug because the template... Uh, <coughs> The bang has more precedence than the tilde. So format says, hey, you give me a percentage. So the format stops here. So you have to put these parentheses around the format string to get it done. Well, I mean, it hurt me, meaning, what's happening here? What, what is this reason? And it was a minor gotcha, at least. But this was a memorable bug, because this was an old bug I put in there, which was, um, 
obscured by other bugs. When I fix the other bugs, I hit this one, which in code I had forgotten that I'd written, a ref was missing. I understand that the compiler cannot in all cases save me from this, but this hurt me. Yay, <laughs> 95 structs in this code, one class hierarchy, one interface and two um, class implementations. Multiple dispatch. So we always hear multiple dispatch is overblown, we don't need it. I needed it in this case. If you remember the code, smart code generation, the helpful code generation, that depends on the kinds of the old variables and new variables. So it's actually double dispatch. So why, what I ended up doing is generated this predicate functions and the generator function. I created an array full of that struct. So if any array to static array type, I set a predicate to check for that. And then the generator right in underneath, these are all lambdas, I'm, I've shortened the code. And then any array to dynamic array. And the order in this array is important because I, at runtime, I went in here and walked through it to find the match. I was actually doing multiple dispatch, double dispatch there. And at the end, I put a catch all, and I equals question my comp mark compilation error comes from that catch all, basically. So I remembered Jean Louis Leroy, Leroy, Leroy's open methods library, which someone else mentioned here. <coughs> Useful stuff. I did not use it. Dub is great. It just works. Dub build, awesome. And, it, and again, interestingly, I had never used Dub. One of my colleagues who looked at D said, use Dub, it works perfect. Okay, it worked. Except it drops a directory in your source code, source directory. And our build system mounts the source read-only. So it's impossible for us to use. It wants to be run from the source directory and drops a directory in there, doesn't work. Okay, we, we were gonna use CMake anyway as a wrapper around dub, but then we went to proper CMakeD. Okay, I, I had fun with op dispatch. This has been mentioned earlier. This is a wonderful feature of D. I created a by map. <laughs> a by map is basically you add two elements, they are associated with each other. If I say, give me 42's value, it comes back as Mary. Give me Mary's value, it comes back as 42. So both of those values are keys and values themselves. So in, just for fun, actually, I said, wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, give me name for 42, Mary, and give me number for Mary, comes back 42. And here's the op dispatch that manages it. When you generate the struct, you also give key A and key B names. And op dispatch says, oh, if op equals key B4, uh, this is the B one. The, also, there's another one for the key A. I could have generalized this more, but then I said I'm doing too much. I only need two of these. So this was fun. Progress bar was fun. Instead of using block uh, progress bar, when I Googled for it, others did the same trick. You can use Unicode uh, blocks with one bit size differences, and it looks like a very nicely progressing progress bar. I put this, and then I realized the progress bar was cluttering the output for everything that it does. I wrapped it under um, with this patient progress bar, and I said, don't show me any progress bar. Uh, unless it waits n plus seconds, so it is three for now. Most of the time you don't see anything. Once it hits something, you see it. So this is the kind of fun I talk about. You know, programming is fun. And some command line fun. Uh, the tools take parameters. Uh, thanks to the standard op opt module, of course, if you have an array of something, you can multiply provide the dash i multiple times and it puts everything into an array. Then I realized it's becoming tedious and I came up with this syntax, but I did not invent it. I remembered this syntax from another tool. I could not find that tool anymore. Do you guys know which tool does this? DMD, DMD does this? Okay, so I used something I learned from D ecosystem. So at my file means, 
that's not the option, but read it from the my file, and it's recursive. If you, while reading, you see another ad, read it from there. OK, I really looked for some well-known <coughs> grep and friends-like tools. I should have looked at DMD. OK, I can repeat it. it. There's an HTTP tool that does the same thing. So it's a standard, but I just couldn't remember. I, I like this. OK, so I missed the mutable keyword. Maybe it was my design mistake. But I wanted to calculate something lazily as people needed it. Um, I could have designed around it, but I just removed the const where it should have been const, and I started passing these huge containers, associative array containing big guys as non-const stuff, knowing that I don't change them. Um, I needed to use JSON. Standard JSON is not up to standard, let's say, compared to, again, the Go experience that I had. We can do much better. But some of us, I talked to some of us, Steve and others, think maybe it shouldn't be in the standard library anyway. You pick any version you want, or when you use VibeD, it comes with its own. So I had to do some work to get JSON standard JSON working. I have some wrapper functions around it. And this is the stonewalling moment. There are zero private keywords in this code base for no reason. But that's how it is. Maybe I should be on a soapbox again. So maybe I'm not a programmer who goes into types and grabs all the internals of it. I always use types according to their documentation, or maybe unit test. So my only interaction with private so far has been difficulty. I had some work at Weka, for example. Now they are happier because the compiler produces more information for them. At that time, they needed a struct from the garbage collector that contained statistical information. They really wanted this to the, improve their quality, but it was private in the GC module. You can go around the private. You can just grab the symbol and access the symbol directly. The linker doesn't understand any private anything. So because my personal experience has been, if you hit a private thing, that only hurts you. I just didn't put it in there. I apologize, and it, this shows you how good or a bad programmer I am. Yay, I made it. Yes, you've got a minute left. Thank you, guys. All right, so clearly we've got time for questions. So raise your hands, raise your hands. There's one. Uh, I had a question about the, peop the people aspect of things. So I've been in several companies where they've introduced the concept called a tech radar where it's often someone in management who will control a list of technologies that are allowed, and it essentially becomes a blocker. I've taken this approach of implementing things, making them work, put them in the build, and then I hit a wall. What do I do? So actually, <laughs> I, I, hit a, I hit that wall too in, in this project. So everything well went very well. Just everybody is appreciative. The tool works experimental. Right at the end, it's already in the repo. We're using the tool that we're building it manually with dub build. Right when we decided to connect to the build system, CMakeD came in, and we produced a pull request for CMakeD, and right then we hit a wall saying, what is CMakeD? Where is this D coming from? It's not one of our official languages. So it happened. In this case, I guess uh, D was lucky because it was already established, and it was decided the team that decided, not myself, let's say, the team that owned this tool had decided already, and it went through this three-month-long some iteration. It's already agreed on, and now it's up approved. But it was difficult, so I, I don't know what to say. And I had this problem in previous companies. I remember this painfully, you know. Let's write this new thing. Of course, it should be in D. I'm excited. And we made a table. D versus Python. That language was Python. D wins every aspect on every line, except one. Let's say 
uh, I don't even remember, maybe maturity, Python was more mature, or maybe it might be the libraries were already written, even though the libraries need not be huge, that you could write it in D. So it's like one thing uh, makes you lose. So they go to Python. So it makes me think, again, the people, the person already wants Python. And they, they're looking for one reason to do it. And if you're in such an environment, I don't think there's a way to do it. And you can't argue. I mean, I think everybody agrees here by now. It just worked in this case. I mean, luckily, I'm surprised, actually. <laughs> <laughs> OK, any more questions? Stefan? Another question, more a bit of a comment. I would say you did the right call with private. I can also say that it puts up barriers where there shouldn't be any. And if you do need to rely on private, then maybe you should select your program as better. Stefan Koch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joseph's got a question there. <laughs> So given that you're um, apparently hiring, um, what are the prospects for being able to write more decode inside your organization? I, I, I don't know. Uh, so uh, I think this is the seed. You know, other tools may build around it, but I can assure you people who use the tool are looking at D. Oh, this is nice, yeah. Uh, especially that half second thing, people who wrote the web interface, now they can display that image to their cu customers, you know, their users. So that's the happy part. Yeah. So I guess in your case, if you build it, they will come. Yes, it, it worked this, in this case. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Uh, this is actually not a question, but more of a joke. You mentioned uh, DC uh, certification for Ross. Uh, can Walter do something about it? <laughs> I, I don't know how that works. Yeah, yeah. even uh, for C++ code, like it's third parties certify somehow, I think. And I've heard like $500 per line of code scale uh, projects. So I don't know how it's done. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if you read about ASIL levels, you can bring any ASIL 1, 2, 3 thing to ASIL 4 with certain um, process. For example, if you have an ASIL 3 device that it can fail at 1% probability, you can put 10 of them. And so, so it's all about probability. Risk is in this whole functional safety thing, and I'm learning this myself. So you make it ACLD if you put 10. But, but I don't know how that process exactly works. Yeah, I've got time for one more question down here. Uh, how do you distribute the compiler in the build system? Oh, that was easy to go in, because in, in that case, I guess it did not go into the Git repo, but it went into our local um, uh, package repo. We needed that tool, we put it in there. Whatever libraries and whatever tools we need go in there, and it was already there. So if you say um, sudo apt-get dmd, boom, you get it. It's in the repo. It went through another backdoor, let's say. All right, and that's it. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, guys. <laughs>